In late summer 1609, Henry Hudson, his first mate Robert Jewett, and the crew of the Half Moon entered the mouth of today's Hudson River. For the Native Americans who dwelled near this river, known to them as the Mohicanatuck, this was not the first time they had seen Europeans venture up this body of water. The Lenape, Wappinger, and Mohican tribes of the Algonquian language group, and the Mohawk, an Iroquois tribe, had all had experience trading with the European explorers, as the select goods and natural resources offered to Hudson's crew proved. A sophisticated system of communication among the language groups and trade networks quickly spread news of the Europeans' activities and suspected intentions. In addition to a complex communications network, Eastern Native American technology, art, trade, and society were highly advanced by the 17th century. Transcontinental trade had been in place for hundreds of years, and nations of people along the Hudson River were well aware of their neighbors to the north, south, east, and west. Europeans, however, were vastly different and held opposing values to the peoples who had lived on this continent for centuries. Descriptions of early contact with the Native Americans are often found among the writings of religious clerics of every order. In 1644, Domine Megapolensis wrote an extensive description of the Indians dwelling around Rensselaerswick. The inhabitants of this country are of two kinds. First, the Mahakambas, Second, the Mahakans. These two nations have different languages, which have no affinity with each other, like Dutch and Latin. They make their houses of the bark of trees, very close and warm, and kindle their fires in the middle of them. They also make of the peeling and bark of trees, canoes or small boats, which will carry four, five, and six persons. In like manner, they hollow out trees and use them for boats, some of which are very large. I have several times sat and sailed with them, 12 and 14 persons in one of these hollowed logs. Within just a few years of Henry Hudson's ship exploring the Mahicanatuck, the first Dutch capitalists, fur traders rather than settlers, were making a foothold along the river, enticed by the abundant beaver, muskrat, mink, otter, and fisher pelts. Native Americans, eager for European trade goods such as linen shirts, woolen blankets, brass kettles, and glass beads, changed their seasonal patterns, altering their traditional way of life in order to accommodate the demand for animal furs, which they hunted from the north and west of the Hudson River. One report from New Netherland explained, The beaver trade, if all the Indians come home with beavers, may turn out to be very good, for almost all the river Indians are out hunting so that there are not enough men left home to fish with their drag nets. In 1614, a trading house was established on a small island in the river. The bit of land was named Castle Island, and the Dutch West India Company's Fort Nassau was built there. Soon abandoned due to fairly annual spring floods, this makeshift fort was replaced by Fort Orange on the mainland in 1624. The Dutch West India Company operated a monopoly on the fur trade from the strategically located and well-appointed fort until 1630, when some trade concessions were given to the patroon. It became immediately apparent to the Dutch West India Company that in order to protect their investments in New Netherland, they would need a body of citizens interested in making this mountainous wilderness valley their home. Convincing Dutch citizens accustomed to a country of vastly deforested, wet lowland to leave and travel an uncertain ocean voyage to a land completely foreign and void of familiar people was a huge task and one the Dutch West India Company preferred to leave to wealthy agents called patroons. They struck a deal with one such agent, Killian van Rensselaer, a wealthy jeweler from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He was to receive about three quarters of a million acres near the Fort Orange trading post in return for establishing farms and settling at least 50 souls on the land with all the amenities needed to support a farming community. While Killian Van Rensselaer ran the operation from abroad for a few years, Rensselaerswick would soon pass to the two eldest Van Rensselaer children, Jan Baptiste Van Rensselaer and Jeremias Van Rensselaer. Both young men were in their early 20s when they set foot in New Netherland to run the family interests both in Rensselaerswick and at the port in New Amsterdam, or Manahata. Anna van Rensselaer, widow of Killian, often wrote letters of admonishment and advice to her sons abroad. 
In February of 1659, she wrote to her younger son in New Netherland. I see from your letter that you have much bad luck, both with the merchandise and with your cattle, for which I am sorry. I wish that it were otherwise, and the best advice I can give is that you question yourself and examine whether it is not your own fault, and whether perhaps you are not serving God as you should. These Van Rensselaer brothers held great responsibility in the New World, with farm families, ministers, indentured servants, traders, mill, bakery, and tavern operators, slaves and relatives all looking to them for protection and for their livelihood. In addition, the courts of New Netherland and the Dutch West India Company's director general and soldiers helped keep the peace in order for the colony to function as a growing trade community. Shipments from the Netherlands often contained livestock, fine glassware, jewelry and gold, weapons, ceramics, wine, leather goods, fabrics such as linen, silk and wool, and goods for the Indian trade. In a memorandum to himself, Jeremiah Van Rensselaer wrote from Rensselaerswick, Goods which I ordered from Holland by the Vergould Beer, July 11, 1658. Six pairs of shoes, two pairs of Spanish leather, three pairs gray, and one pair waterproof, 15 florin. Two pairs of gray Syed stockings, 10 florin. Some rope harness, but it must be better than what I have had, 40 florin. A set of two head stalls and reins, 10 florin. Six shirts of linen, and at one floor in a yard. In addition, ships from the Dutch Caribbean brought rum, sugar, dyes, and cotton to the north. Archaeological evidence, taken with shipping documents, letters, and court records, show the Dutch settlers of the Hudson River Valley possessing the same material culture here as was common in the Netherlands. In combination with Dutch genre paintings, these forms of evidence may be used today to approximate life here in the 17th century Dutch colony. While the first dwelling houses in New Netherland were often modest in nature, they usually followed a familiar Dutch form and sometimes combined a barn and house under one roof. Early houses were sometimes wooden with stone foundations, but some stone and brick houses were to be found in the countryside during the first half of the 17th century. Interiors were plastered white, and if the house were stone or brick, a jamless fireplace was positioned, most usually, at the center of one of these interior walls. Swedish naturalist and visitor to Albany, Peter Kahn, described these fireplaces in his travels in North America. The fireplace in the houses in the country was built in an unusual way, and it was nearly always placed in the wall on the gable end opposite the door. The fireplace, for about six feet or more from the ground, consisted of nothing more than the wall of the house, which was six to seven feet wide, and made of brick only. There were no projections on the sides of the fireplace, so it was possible to sit on all three sides of the fire and enjoy the warmth equally. Most cooking occurred over hot coals on the hearth, and trivets, legged pots, or Dutch ovens were positioned over these coals. Coals were also piled atop the Dutch oven. A hood positioned over the hearth directed smoke up to a hole in the ceiling. In order to convince other Europeans to make the perilous voyage to New Netherland, the Dutch West India Company, the Patroon, Dutch Domines or Ministers, and New World business people and farmers described the land in fantastical terms. One Domine claimed in the early 1600s that New Netherland encompassed the lands where milk and honey flow. An early settler wrote to his Dutch minister in the homeland in 1624, here we found beautiful rivers, bubbling fountains flowing into valleys, basins of running water in the flatlands, agreeable fruits in the woods, considerable fish in the rivers, good tillage lands. Here was especially free coming and going without fear. It is true the soil was conducive for growing. Very little of the land had been worked before and so was rich with nutrients for growing crops and feeding livestock. Wheat became a staple for the colonists and key in the many bakeries and breweries that sprung up nearly immediately. Wheat was also shipped back to Europe, and Hudson Valley wheat was prized as among the best available. Tobacco, rye, peas, and barley were also significant crops exported by the Dutch colonials. Familiar migratory birds and fish were found along the Hudson. Others, unfamiliar, such as the turkey, were shipped back to the homeland and became popular imports to Europe. 
oysters, crabs, and mussels could easily be procured and were favorites among the Dutch. With the introduction of European agricultural animals and crops to the New World, the prospect of traveling across the Atlantic Ocean to settle an unfamiliar and relatively unpopulated land was made more appealing to the Dutch population. New Netherland existed as a Dutch colony until 1664, when the British took New Amsterdam without much resistance. Briefly, in 1673, the Dutch again took control of the colony. Within a year, however, the colony was again British, as it was to remain until the Revolutionary War. Despite the national status of the colony along the Hudson River Valley, Dutch tradition held fast well into the 18th century. In 1749, Peter Kahn described the inhabitants of Albany and its environs as almost all Dutchmen. They speak Dutch, have Dutch preachers, and the divine service is performed in that language. Their manners are likewise Dutch. About the buildings, he noted, The houses in this town are very neat and partly built of stone covered with shingles of white pine. Some are slated with tile from Holland because the clay of this neighborhood is not considered fit for tiles. Most of the houses are built in the old Frankish way with the gable end toward the street. Building styles of the Netherlands were still in use by Hudson River Valley Dutch descendants up to the 19th century, and today can be found throughout the communities along the river. Considering the relatively short time the Dutch government had control over this area, the Dutch colonists' presence is still felt in so many ways. Place names, surnames, holiday traditions, and literature are just a few. Indeed, this sweet and alien land was forever changed by the arrival of the Dutch. <laughs>